part 6 of my mechanical raid team guide against the Screamer Killer this time, and this will be a showcase of one of my battles against it. And here I will be assuming that you have already watched the um, preliminary considerations that I went through, and also hopefully um, Nandi's guide on fighting this boss. This will just simply be a play-by-play -play with me explaining why I'm doing what I'm doing as I'm doing it, and probably getting ahead of myself as well at certain points. So, without further ado, let's get started. Now, I do good for once because I shoot first with Shosal, which means that his sniper drone will be the first of my summons acting in the next turn, which is good because there will be a Hormagaunt alive, and that Hormagaunt because of the way I've planned things, I believe it will be next to both the Screamer Killer and the or one of the Tyranid Warriors. I don't think the big target bonus stacks twice, but if it does, that means that if the Skitari were to act first and try and kill the Hormagaunt, they would ha be having either their damage output per attack being reduced by two-thirds if big target stacks. If it doesn't stack, it will still be being reduced by a third. So I want the sniper drone to attack first because it does enough damage to kill the Hormagaunt in one hit and it also doesn't have its damage output reduced by big target because it only deals a single hit. So that's why I've done that. Now you might think, Limey, you've um, moved your tan quite far up. Well, I want to... Well first of all, of course I also want to shoot that Hormagaunt with Shosil because I'm killing this uh, warrior here and I don't want Tan to shoot this Hormagaunt when activated by Actus and I'm killing this warrior with Tan's normal attack because it does more damage than the attack where he's activated by Actus. So if, I, if I'm giving him a choice between shooting two different targets he might shoot the closer one which means that Shosil would then have nobody to shoot at, so that's another reason for shooting with Shosil first. But move Tan up quite far, that's simply because I want to get two Skitari spawned with him, and the only way I can do that is if I have this Hormagaunt here in range of him, and I have set this up all up so that the boss will come down to low ground. And the reason I know this will happen is because I know that Tan will follow his rules, which I've talked about before in terms of deploying Skitari, where he'll put them on the high ground first. So he'll put one here and one here, once he's done attacking. And the way the um, Screamer Killer behaves is that it, if possible, when it moves, it will try and use its um, melee area of effect ability. And so if it moves into this area here, it will have a Skitaris here to hit, a Tan to hit, a Skitaris here, and ultimately I'll be moving Row here as well. So that gives it four targets to hit in melee with its AoE, which is its preferred move, and it won't have any other areas it can move to where it can do the AoE and hit at least three characters. So you can guarantee with what I'm doing that it will move into this sort of depression in the ground, which is good because it means that Essentially, all of my units and characters will be doing bonus high ground damage to the Screamer Killer, as most of the ground on the map is high ground relative to this little depression in the ground here. So let's um, get the Skitari out. Of course, it wouldn't be one of my replays if there wasn't a mistake early on. My mistake here was thinking that the um, Screamer Killer was actually on this hex, so what I was thinking was, if Tan spawns a Skitarius here, then the Skitarius will be in range of its ranged attack, if it was on this hex, and if it acts, if it doesn't have a Tyranid Warrior nearby, then it will act instinctively, which means that it wouldn't move down, and it would simply do a ranged attack against the Skitarius here. I didn't want it to not move down from the high ground, obviously, because that would drastically reduce the amount of damage I could do. So I thought, well, I'll have the Skitarius here, and then this Tyranid Warrior will attack the Skitarius, 
and when it moves into attack the Skitarius, then the Screamer Killer, if the warrior moves here, will be under the effect of Synapse, which means that it will act without uh, instinctive behaviour, and so it will decide to move down to the low ground here rather than using its ranged attack. And if the Tyranid Warrior is here, it has a movement of free. So I thought potentially it might move to where Eldrion is standing. And if it moved to where Eldrion is standing, then the Screamer Killer would not be in Synapse range, which means it would act instinctively, which means it would um, attack the Skitarius with its ranged attack. Of course, that was never actually going to happen because it wasn't on this hex, but that was just something silly that I did. Because I, this is my first time using Shosel on this map. So I moved Elgion here to block the Tyranid Warrior from not being in Synapse range of the uh, Screamer Killer in the, at the start of the next turn. And just move Ro to where he'll be next to the boss. So as you can see there, the Hormagaunt, even though it was buffed by Big Target, didn't matter. It got killed in one hit by the Sniper Drone, and also because it was being doomed. And the Tyranid Warrior is almost dead. Now, as usual, I don't want to waste any attacks from mechanical units finishing off the Warrior, because they're much better spent on triggering Rose's passive ability, so I will just finish the Warrior with Eldrion's melee attack. And Eldrion is in a position to doom the boss, and... No mechanical ta attacks have been wasted, and I'll start to clear out a space where I want to move Tan and Actus to, to begin spawning in Skitari. So this is all just setting up really, there's not much to talk about honestly from this point onwards. I'm, I'm able to start using the Forge Fiend's passive here, I suppose I can talk about that. The Forge Fiend's passive, when the um, Screamer Killer is on a Flaming Hex, will deal a bit of plasma damage to it. And that damage is actually boosted by Eldrion's Doom, so you can do a few thousand damage per turn. I suppose the amount of damage depends on how well leveled up you have your Forge Fiend, but it does a non-negligible amount of damage, but really it's nothing to write home about either, especially not in comparison to the damage output of your mechanical team. Also, because of the fact that the Skitari can leave toxic clouds under a boss when they shoot at it, the toxic clouds replace the flame. Which means that once, and you can only use your Forge Fiend after the summons have acted. So there's a very high chance that by the time you're actually able to do anything with the Forge Fiend, the boss will no longer have any flames underneath it, so you can't actually do anything to it. So in that situation, you just attack with all of your Skitari, get all of their attacks out of the way, lay more flame down under the boss at the end of the turn, and then hopefully in the next turn it won't get a toxic cloud underneath it and you'll actually be able to do some damage. But yeah, it, it's a way of dealing a little extra damage, but it's really nothing to write home about. You could use the Malleus launcher and use the uh, Guardsman to do damage instead, but I'm kind of wary of using that on one hand because the summons they're kind of stupid and they might run into melee and get killed by the boss and uh, make it start hitting harder because it increases its uh, critical chance. And also just for the fact that they occupy spaces at 2 hex range around the boss. And I don't want them potentially getting in the way of Skitari because it's much more important to have the Skitari shooting at the boss than it is to have Guardsmen who can't trigger Rose passive ability. So I'm just building up a sort of shell of Skitari around the around Tan now. I'm moving Eldrion well out of the way so that hopefully the next Skitaris I spawn will move into the hex that Eldrion was on. And then later on I can, um, when I use uh, Actus's active ability, I can potentially activate more 
Skitari at once than if the Skitaris was over here instead, or maybe here. So that's why I've done that. And of course, as usual, make sure you heal Tan first so that you can then switch over to Conqueror mode and get a lot of extra attacks in from his summons being triggered by it. And I'm preparing for later on where I might want to move Ro sort of into this area around the boss because, um, again, if I have Tan here and I have Actus here and I use Actus's active ability, I want to have Ro next to Actus so that he benefits from being made to attack again via Actus's active. And he obviously won't be able to get there very easily if he's sort of in this region of the map, rather than starting to shuffle his way around to, well, to where he is. I haven't used his active yet because I didn't have all of my summons out, but I'll be saving it for the last two turns, and there is a reason for that. I'll get into that when the time comes. Again, this is going to be another quite boring round. I think the only thing to... So, yeah, I attacked there with um, the Forge Fiend first to make sure I got the plasma damage before my um, Skitari started shooting at the boss and covering it in toxic clouds. So that, that's one thing to think about. Now I move Shosil here, and I know that his sniper drones sort of like to follow him around because they act as sort of like bodyguards with their passive. And the idea was, was to have a sniper drone here and a sniper drone here, which gives a sort of a ring of four mechanical summons, which I could then set off with Tan's um, conqueror mode. So that's why I've moved Shosil over that way. But that doesn't work out here. And I was expecting it to not work out because... No sniper drone is going to want to move onto that hex because it doesn't have high ground relative to the boss. So they'll prefer to move onto high ground, say here or here or here, anywhere really. That isn't on the low grounds in this sort of section or this section. So I don't expect a sniper drone to move here, however... I do expect this sniper drone to stay still, and then if I fire with Shosil to get him to spawn a sniper drone here, I can then move, um, as long as this hex is empty and there's a sniper drone here and a sniper drone here, I can then move Tan into position to get four mechanical summons triggered per turn rather than a mere three, which I have over here. But that requires some setting up, so I haven't used Rose active yet, because I'm anticipating that I'll only be able to pull that off in the last round. So I should use his active ability in the penultimate rounds to hopefully get the most out of it. I was kind of worried, now that I've switched over to Conqueror mode, that if this summon got critted, because uh, it gets hit... If Axis or Tan got hit by the boss's melee attack, then everything adjacent to them gets hit as well. And if this summon got critted, it was at low enough health where I was sort of slightly concerned that it might, if the boss got really lucky, it might die. So I noticed that Ro had a, a chunk of health missing, sort of more than Actus and Tan, and I moved him onto the flames here to take a chunk out of his health and hopefully start attracting melee attacks onto Ro rather than onto Tan or Actus to make sure that this guitarist didn't get killed. And also, again, moving row around to this area of the map was my ultimate plan anyway, so this is all very much planned out, not just random, <laughs> despite how it may appear to some viewers, I'm sure. And I'm about to make a mistake. And that mistake is, well, so I move Shosaw here, and again, that means that this sniper drone will stay in its current position, because
because it wants to act as his bodyguard. And it has high ground relative to the boss, so there's no reason for it to move. And I want it to stay there. So this is all fine. And then the uh, drone dies, but then again, I'm thinking, well, these two drones also want to act as bodyguards for Shosil, so one of them will move over here anyway, so it's not the end of the world. This is all going still fine. It doesn't matter that that drone just got despawned. Now there's going to be a lot of hits, of course, because it's the mechanical team, and not, nothing much to comment on here. As usual, I'm just trying to get as many hits out of town as possible. A bit of lag. <laughs> Bear with it. And that was the mistake. Was shooting the flame at the screamer killer in the hopes that in the next turn it wouldn't get poison gla uh, it wouldn't get the toxic clouds underneath it so that I could hit it with the forge fiend again and maybe do a couple of thousand extra damage what I should have done is put flame here and you'll see why in a moment so I know that Shosil doesn't like to spawn his drones onto flaming hexes so I wanted to restrict the options of where he would spawn the drone down to this hex only. However, because of the way the Forge Fiend works, I couldn't cover this hex. So I shot with him. And he spawned the drone into this hex here. If instead of shooting at the Screamer Killer in the previous turn with the Forge Fiend's passive, I had put the flames here preemptively, I could have put more flames here before Shosil fired, and then, which would have then ensured that he spawned the sniper drone into this hex, which would then mean that I could move Tan here, move Axis here, move Ro here, and then I'd have Tan setting off four mechanical summons with each attack he does. I'd have Axis's active setting off Tan, two Skitari, and Ro, and just in general I would have done a bit more damage in the final round than I ended up doing because the drone ended up spawning over here, where it couldn't be activated by Tan. So that was a bit of a loss. Not a huge loss, but enough to be annoying. And as always, I ask myself, is it really worth doing X action? And I really should have asked myself, is it really worth thinking, oh, maybe I'll get a couple of thousand extra damage out of the... Um, Forge Fiend, because if I'd had the Sniper Drone spawn here, in, which I could have done if I had acted differently with it, then I would have got two extra mechanical hits in this turn, which translates to however much extra damage that is from the extra mechanical summon attacking, but also two extra hits from Ro whilst he has his active online, which adds up to quite a bit of damage, I think it's around 11,000 damage or so, so that's another probably 20k damage I could have done here. It's not a huge amount in the grand scheme of things, but, you know, if you're going to do something, you might as well do it as best as you possibly can, and I did make a bit of an error with what I did with the Forge Fiend. But yeah, that is one thing to consider with the Forge Fiend, is you can use the flames to manipulate how your summons act and are spawned in. And I think that's where I shall leave this.